And as you can see, it says recording. Um, so you'll be able to see uh, what I'm doing in the class. So um, for the purpose of the recording, I'm going to share the screen. We are in biology. A. I am Mrs. Hack. Um, a little bit about myself. Sorry. Oh, you're in the Google Meet. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to join right now if you don't want to. <laughs> um, okay. So about me, I'm Mrs. Hack. I'm married to Mr. Hack. Same Tyson. Uh, we've got four boys. One's a, the starting quarterback in Panhandle. Uh, this one, he's the youngest. He loves baseball and football. Um, a middle one, he's in CAP, Civil Air Patrol, and then the other one he actually goes here, he's in um, his finite class, his name's Tyler. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty busy, always running and gunning with the kids. Um, I graduated from Randall High School studied biology at Amarillo College, and I received my bachelor's in biochemistry from WT. I'm going to go real fast. Crap, hold on. I'm not very technology savvy, so I guess I messed up. Okay, so what is science? It is a method that humans use to understand and explain the world around us. Uh, the main goal of science is to discover truth. So, you know, you can have an opinion like green. I don't particularly care for green. You know, I think it's ugly and therefore I don't think it exists. It's not there. Well, science is like, the, no, it's there. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not true, right? So science is about truth, and you find those truths by observing the world around you, experimentation. In fact, science is involved in every aspect of your life, uh, from the food you eat, the way you travel, the car you an airplane you may have been on, um, the way you talk to other people, your cell phones, internet, um, even if you get sick, have a disease, you get medicine, that's all science. Now, more specifically, what is biology? So biology um, is a two-rooted word. You have bio, which means life, and ology means the study of. So put it together, it's the study of life. Um, in this course, we're going to learn what it means to be alive according to the scientific definition and how living things come into existence. We're going to explore how living things interact with other living things. We will um, see where the future of biology is headed, understand why you're alive, um, why it's important to study living things, and so forth. Uh, when it comes to scientific understanding, there are three levels. Uh, first is the hypothesis. So you'll make an observation. You'll create a hypothesis. And from that hypothesis, you will form an experiment. And if your hypothesis is true, you can create a theory. Now, a theory is going to be an explanation of something, so something that you observe. The theory will explain that, and it will have also been experimented. 
so several times. And several scientists will experiment on the same thing until everybody agrees and then it becomes theory. Now a scientific law is going to be simple, um, usually stated in just a mathematical equation. And um, you can have several laws that will build on each other to create a theory. Um, there are three main fields of study. There's earth and space science, so geology and astronomy. And as you would guess, earth science is about earth, so anything that makes up earth, air, land, and water, whereas astronomy is the study of the universe. Uh, then there's the physical sciences, so chemistry and physics. Uh, chemistry emphasizes the chemicals that make up matter, that is both non and living, non-living and living, um, and how they interact with each other. And then physics will focus on the laws that apply to all matter, also both living and non-living. Uh, so it's so physics studies things such as sound and light. Um, and then there is life science or biology, and it specifically deals with living things. So when you think about history, you think, why does history matter? Well, historians, they like to look into the past to discover um, whether something worked or not. So you make an observation, you're going to dig up the past to see if somebody else before you made that observation. Um, and you can kind of learn from them. And you may even be able to expand on that. So um, more complex things come from simpler things. You just build on each other. There was an empress named Shiling Chi, and we're going to watch a video about her. Be it truth, myth, fable, or all three spun together, this is the tale of a very important biologist, the Chinese Empress Shi Lin Qi. Over 3,700 years ago, the Chinese Empress was watching small worms spinning amber cocoons in a mulberry tree. She pulled out a long strand of shiny material. She used it to make a beautiful piece of cloth, which became a robe for her husband, Emperor Huang Ti. The material was silk, the cloth of kings. Huang Ti learned to raise and care for the silkworms and to make the best thread from the cocoons. The process was kept secret for over 2,000 years, allowing China to keep a monopoly on the silk fabric trade for a long time. Growing silkworms is now a science, and they call it sericulum. So she discovered silkworms in her garden. Um, Aristotle, he is the, he's known as the founder of zoology, which is the study of animals and the scientific method. Uh, he wanted to use logical methods to study how the real world worked. Instead of just thinking about life, he used observations of the natural world. One of his studies was the life cycle of fish. He wished to examine and compare many different types of fish to know what their essential characteristics were. He wanted to know the characteristics of all fish, or the ones that they all had in common. So he created the scientific method. Uh, Mary Anning, Anning, she is a famous paleontologist, they said that she had great eyes, so she could go out to a field that paleontologists before her were in, and she could find bones that they passed over. In fact, she um, discovered all of these dinosaurs here, all those fossils. Neat. Um, so Ben Carson, Benjamin Carson, 
he uh, was a famous neurosurgeon who successfully separated and joined twins. But the thing that I find really cool about him is that, you know, he started out in extreme poverty um, and he was, he was just always getting in trouble in school. He's always getting into fights. He was failing. And his mother, um, she couldn't even read, but she made him and his brother walk to the library every day and they had to do two book reports um, for her every week. They had to give her two book reports. And eventually he started reading more and more about science and scientific journals. And he started thinking of himself as a scientist and envisioned a better future for himself. And he ended up becoming um, a very, very famous man. He invented the process called hypothermic arrest. So what he did was he cooled the, the conjoined twins' bodies way, way down to where their blood flowed a lot slower so that whenever he separated them, they didn't bleed to death. Um, so when thinking like a scientist, you use the scientific method. First, you'll observe um, and then do research and then you'll question. So the problem question can be formulated in the form of, what is the effect of blank on blank? So what is the effect of temperature on a fish population? Okay. Um, and then when you, be, when you start your hypothesis, you want it to be very clear and concise. So first you come up with your, you see your observation. You see that there's a pond full of fish and it's warm and sunny. You're like, huh, I wonder what the effect of temperature on fish is. So then in your hypothesis, you're going to do some research. You're going to see what other scientists before you have found out about the temperature on fish. And then when you come up with your hypothesis, you'll say, well, if the temperature is 70 degrees, then the population of fish will be greater than if the temperature was lower or whatever. So you want it to be very specific. You want the warmer temperature will have more fish. So then you will um, design an experiment. And the reason you do an experiment is to confirm whether or not your hypothesis is true. So if your hypothesis is not true, then you would reject it and start over. So you would say, okay, well, from this experiment, I learned that temperature has nothing to do with fish population. Um, and then you would maybe think of another thing that affects the population of fish, if you really care about fish. Um, then a scientist will examine the results. You're going to discuss them with other people. You're going to draw your conclusion. Um, make future recommendations. The conclusion might cause a scientist to propose a new hypothesis or try a different experiment. And then repeat that experiment to verify the results. So once you've finished your experiment, you'll say, oh, that was a great experiment. Everything worked out perfect. My hypothesis was correct. Now let's repeat it to see if I get the same results. Because guess what? If you don't get the same results the second time, then maybe you did something wrong the first time. So then you're going to repeat it again. You just keep repeating it forever. Um, and then you're going to make your conclusions and report it to a peer-reviewed um, journal. So when you're reading like a like, like a life scientist, you're going to do research, okay? But not all research is created equal. You have factual, you have fictional, and you have promotional research. Um, so whenever you're going to find out if your observation, um, you want to find all of the information about your observation before you make your hypothesis you're going to be looking for factual research. Uh, the gold standard for factual research is the peer-reviewed article. And the reason that peer-reviewed journals are so important is because your research will then be taken and it will be distributed among like scientists. They will read it. They will gather their own information. They will read 
repeat your experiments. And if they get the same results, then they're going to say, this research is good. If they don't get the research or the same results, they'll say, no, this research is not good and it will not be published. So it's important to do your research in the peer reviewed journal because you know that other scientists have also reviewed it and proven that this is true. Uh, textbooks are another good source um, that you can go to to learn about biology um, because they have also been reviewed by other scientists and usually um, information in them only comes from that. Now, fictional research. Um, let's take Dr. Andrew Wakefield. For example, in, the 80, in 88, he um, published a paper that said that vaccines cause autism. Um, and it wasn't until 2003 that scientists had reviewed his article, tried to redo his experiment, and found out that there is no correlation between vaccines and autism. Um, ways that you can spot fictional research is if you can find numerous studies that say the opposite. So um, if the research only used a couple of subjects instead of a lot, and if it's someone's opinion. Uh, promotional research is going to be, it's kind of tricky because a lot of times they can do an experiment and prove that the experiment or that their hypothesis is true, but it's because they skewed the results. They only picked a certain demographic to use it on or um, they, you know, they threw out the bad and only kept the good. So it could be that they really did do the experiment and it could be that they really did research, but maybe it's that they didn't give you the whole truth. So promotional research kind of favors whatever it is that they're selling. Um, the internet is a great place that you can find information um, and do research. However, you need to be careful and make sure that you are looking at um, websites that are reliable. So although Wikipedia cannot be used when you're doing your research, you can certainly start with Wikipedia. So if you go to Okay, so we want to go we want to start at Wikipedia and say we are researching fish population versus temperature. Okay. I'm just going to stick with that for some reason. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's go with this one. This one looks pretty cool. Fish keeping. Um, it tells us that all this good stuff. Okay, so the first thing that you can do, say you find what you're looking for, scroll all the way down to the bottom. Okay, and this is where you're going to find their sources for their information, their references, and you can then go through here and look at this one right here. Um, click on that button. Possibly. But if you click on one of their resources, or sorry, references, then this now can become a valid source for your research, okay? So Wikipedia is not all bad, but I would not read Wikipedia for your reference. I would go to Wikipedia's references and then find a reference from there. All right. 
So the internet's a good place to start or a, a great place to get um, information, especially if a library isn't ready, readily available. Okay, now some tools that the life scientists will use, um, x-rays, so to study the internal structures, um, also MRIs and CT scans. Now out of those three, x-rays and CT scans use radiation, whereas the MRI uses magnetism. Um, and the reason that's important is because there's a lot of um, concern using radiation because it can cause cancer. Now, if you break a bone and you need an x-ray and you get an x-ray, the likelihood of you getting cancer from that one x-ray is not very high at all. However, um, if you are the person taking the x-ray and you stay there in our and are exposed to that radiation day in, day out, that's when it becomes a lot more likely that you could get cancer. So, uh, has anyone ever gone and had to have an x-ray? Okay, so did you notice how the, the x-ray technician came in and she set you all up and then she walked away and she got behind a big wall and then she pressed the button and then she came back and she did everything she needed? Well, that's because that limits her exposure to radiation. In fact, they have to wear these little devices that read radiation and once they reach a certain number, they can never be around radiation again in their whole life. <laughs> yeah. It's called a dosimeter. Um, so what it does is it, it creates, it shoots electrons through your body um, to create an image on the, the scan. And um, that quick electron going through your body can cause change in your cell. And um, it can also damage your cell. Um, other things that they can use are uh, microscopes. So a microscope can make things larger uh, than actual light. The um, compound light microscope can make it up to a thousand times larger. And uh, one cool thing about it is that you could actually watch a living species or, or specimen under the microscope. Now, once you get to the electron microscope, um, you no longer can look at living things because what it does is it shoots those electrons through it um, to get the image. But this will allow it to be blown up up to 200 times larger than um, one other thing is a computer. Computers help us, the scientists, in um, aiding in building models, uh, analyzing their data, doing complex math problems, and also just simply typing up their research. So being a scientist, uh, you, you can't be a scientist without doing science. And you do science by experimentation. Uh, whenever you create an experiment, you'll have a control group, a control variable, a dependent variable, an independent variable, and then you also have extraneous variables. So what is a variable? Variable is the factor that may or may not change in the experiment. So let's go back to temperature and fish. The temperature is a variable and the fish are the variable. So um, your independent variable is going to be the thing that you change on purpose. So the temperature. I'm going to change the temperature of my pond from 70 degrees to 30 degrees. The thing that changes because of the thing I changed is the dependent variable, so the fish population. Because I changed the temperature, the fish population changed or didn't change. That's what we're experimenting on, right? Now, the extraneous variables are the things that you cannot control, and therefore, um, they could interfere with your experiment. So, I can't really think of anything at this moment. But things that you cannot control when you're doing an experiment. Um, the controlled variable is the thing that will not change. So, um, when you begin your experiment, 
um, the amount of water in the in the pond would be a control. Um, and now a control group is something that is going to have everything that's the exact same as the experiment, but the independent variable will stay the same. We don't have to change that. Uh, so do's and don'ts for designing and doing experiments. You're going to want to start with a problem question and hypothesis. Uh, you want to do your background research. You only want one independent variable and one dependable dependent variable. And you want to use a control group and conduct the experiment numerous times. Now for the flip side, the don't side, basically all of those but opposite. So you don't want to have more than one independent or more than one dependent variable. You don't want to fail to do any background research and you don't want to just conduct the experiment once. Okay, that's the end of um, today's lesson. If you would um, go ahead and open up your biology class, let's see. Uh, so go to Genius. And you'll log in. I've already logged in um, previously, so log in. You go to Buzz. Scroll through all your classes until you get to Biology A. And what you're going to complete is lessons one through six and quiz one. So the activity. <clears throat> uh, for the activity, they show you all of these different fields of biology and what is studied in each of those fields. And what it wants you to do is list three of those and give a reason <clears throat> why it's interesting to you. And then, um, so if you'll start working in lesson one and get as far as you can in the next 30 minutes. And then at that point, yes. That's fine. Are you already past quiz one? No, I'm not listening. Okay. Yep. As soon as you finish quiz one, you can go back to class. Um, if you don't get to quiz one before time is up, then you can go back to class and continue working on it. Just make sure that quiz one is complete by Thursday. You might be able to. Um, 